Good morning, Hope 1045. Wonderful to be here for us to meet together. My name is Cameron. Uh, Let me pray for us. Father, help us to sit under your word today and for me to teach what is faithful and true. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What do you think is beautiful by design? Uh, 200 and plus, in fact, designs were submitted for the Sydney Opera House back as part of a big international competition. And of course, the one that we have today was the, the winner, Beautiful by Design. Or what comes to mind, maybe the most beautifully designed car, the, uh, the Jaguar E-Type is usually up there in the rankings. Uh, for me, I'm, I quite like the, uh, the, the, the James Bond Aston Martin DB5, that's a, that's a nice one uh, there. You know what else uh, is, is Beautiful by Design? Believe it or not, the packaging of Apple products, right? <laughs> it's true. There are whole teams dedicated to designing packaging that facilitates the unboxing experience where you just peel off the film and the box just falls out snugly. It's, it's beautiful by design. Today we come to look at this doctrine of male and female and the God-given relationships that we are to have together. So it's a small topic, of course, right? (laughs) We, of course, can only cover so much. But at the very least, I hope we can see the beauty of how God has designed us to relate together. And this is going to be so important for us, right? Because our world is indeed so incredibly confused on this front, confused on who we are as male and female and gender. And there's this whole sort of battle of the sexes thing that goes on where where men and women are put against each other as we're we're treated almost like different species from different worlds. Men are from Mars, women from Venus, this kind of thing. We hear phrases of patriarchal extremism and toxic masculinity and the future is feminine and so forth. And yet at the same time, Our world also goes on to talk about not just the battle of sexes, but the blurring of sexes, where there's no distinction at all. It swaps them or or multiplies them in an ever-growing range and spectrum of gender identities. We live in a culture that is continuously debating and defining and redefining all of this because it wants to know, yes... Who am I? And people, they are searching for this. They, they want to be authentic as people, but our culture is profoundly confused. And sadly, these cultural waves are also sweeping over the church, which is why we need to keep coming back to God's Word, the Bible, as the timeless defining authority. And, you know, actually there is nothing more authentic than listening to the God who made us and living out his beautiful and good design for life and for relationships. You see, the Bible's teaching on male-female relationships is is not actually that complicated. Uh, Yes, sure, it can feel at times rather confronting, contentious, countercultural. But can I say that's precisely because our world is confused and is pushing us away from God's good design. So if there's any issue, it's not not with God's design. It's, It's with us. It's with our distortion of it, our abuse of it, our abandonment of it. So let's firstly go back and see male and female in the beginning. Okay, so join with me, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, in your Bibles or on the screen here. Verse 27, so God created man, that's mankind, humankind, in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. If you missed Mike's talk from a few weeks ago on what it means for us to be human, go back and listen to that. That's super helpful on this front uh, as well. But notice this for now. From the beginning, God has made humanity male and female, and they are made equal. 
equal, equally human, equally in the image of God, equally valued, equally loved by Him. And notice verse 28, equally blessed and addressed by God together to rule His world. Equal in every way. Equal and distinct. Because God has indeed made male and female. They are different. And while some parts of society today say that there is a spectrum of gender, the Bible is very clear. It is binary, male or female, and they are distinct. So sex, gender, like this, this is not um, some kind of, sort of social construct. We don't define them, we don't choose them, no, because from the outset it was God who has specifically, deliberately, beautifully designed us male and female. Now that's not to deny that there are some people who personally wrestle with these things. And they can suffer greatly from frustration and confusion and also suffer when people around them, including Christians, fail to love them well. But it's also true that the reason these struggles are struggles is because they weren't part of God's design for humanity. Which doesn't mean these feelings of gender dysphoria are necessarily sinful, but like every form of human suffering, they are the tragic evidence that we live in a world that is fallen, distorted, broken. And maybe that is your story, that resonates with you in some way, please know you are indeed made in the image of God and you are loved and cherished by Him. But God's design is binary, male and female. In fact, right through Genesis 1, you may have noticed this in previous weeks, God has been making these binary pairings. Okay, The heavens and the earth. Light and darkness, day and night, sea and land and so forth, all the way to the creation of human beings as the ultimate complementary pair, male and female. Now, it's not complement, like I'm saying something nice about you, okay, it's a different word, complement, in that they, they fit together, they work together, they correspond together. That's what male and female do, relationally, physically, sexually. I mean, you don't need to be a scientist or a doctor to know that the male and female anatomy works together sexually in such a way, which is really important if humanity is actually ever going to be multiplying and filling the earth. And what does God say about all of this? It was very good. It was very good. And so then from this wide camera angle of Genesis 1, we now zoom in to Genesis 2, to the garden. And there, as you may have noticed from our reading, we see something shocking. Something is not good. Chapter 2, verse 18 of Genesis reads, Then the Lord God said, It is not good... For man to be alone. Now, that's not saying that Adam was lonely. He certainly wasn't lonely. He walked in the garden with God himself, right? He's not lonely. Adam's not walking around kind of downcast, forlorn, kind of like Romeo and Juliet style, kind of going, oh, Juliet, Juliet, where art thou, Juliet? I know it's the other way around, but you get the idea, right? This is, this is not Adam who sees the problem. God sees the problem. So what's the solution? Well, God does something about it. Still verse 18, I will make a helper as his complement. None of the other animals uh, were a fitting complement. What's to be done? Well, you could say rumour has it that uh, Adam sent God a bit of a shopping list of the, the woman he would like. God looks at this shopping list. And he's like, Whew, okay, this is quite the list, Adam. It's going to cost you an, an arm and a leg. Adam pauses for a moment and goes, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> no, no, that's not, that's not what's going on at all. This, this is initiated by God. This is all God's work. He takes Adam's rib, he makes the woman, he brings her to him, and boy, is Adam delighted. <laughs> and here we have the first marriage with the woman as his compl complement, his helper. 
Now again, just to be clear, this is not a story about how every person needs a spouse. And if you don't have one, then you are alone. That is not this at all. But this is about how humanity as a whole needs male and female to be complete as humanity. And it is about male and female and their complementary roles within this particular relationship of marriage. This phrase for his complement there could be translated quite literally as his like opposite. His like opposite. Think of it like a a two-piece jigsaw puzzle that fits together precisely because they are similar but different. Their differences correspond beautifully with each other. Now, at this point as well, you might go, a helper though? That, that That sounds demeaning. No, no, no. Remember, Genesis 1, equal and distinct, but equal. And remember, helper is not a term or doesn't mean inferior. God himself is described as a helper for his people in Psalm 33, verse 20. See, he's certainly not inferior to them. So the point is this. Those needing help cannot do it on their own. So it's not as if Adam is kind of fine, he's got all things sorted in the garden, but you know, he'll accept you know, little minion nonetheless to do his bidding. That's not what it's like. It's, it's not him going to accept a, a servant while he sits back and they do all the work. That's not it at all. No, man cannot fulfill the role of humanity alone. He needs a helper Because the man needs help. And don't we know it, sisters? (laughs) He needs the help. The man is created first, then the woman, and so she joins him in this task. There's an order to this relationship. And with this order comes different roles that are good because they are given by God. Our society says, you know, your, your role determines your value. And that's been one of these critiques of biblical relationships, that allegedly the Bible values women less because they're given a different role. Rubbish. <laughs> can I say that? That's not it at all. That's not the picture the Bible gives. I hope you can see that. What the Bible does give is this beautiful design of God's for humanity and a beautiful design of marriage. But of course, we don't live in the garden anymore. We are living in the aftermath of the fall of Genesis chapter 3. And so here's our next point. Male and female after the fall. Uh, Adam and Eve, uh, they eat from a certain tree in the garden that God had commanded them not to. And this rejection of God has absolutely catastrophic consequences for all kinds of relationships. Among other things, this first sin was the reversal of the family order. Eve took charge, Adam follows. Eve sins not just as a person, but as a woman and a wife. Adam sins as a man and as a husband. And as you read Genesis 3, you may notice there's this correspondence between the sex, and their curse, the curse that is given to them. Well, let's read from verse 16. He, that's God, said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children in anguish. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And sure, there's, there's a couple of different ideas of what that exactly means, but I think we can clearly see sin has messed up that relationship. Verse 17, And he said to Adam, God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife's voice and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. See that that sort of phrase of painful labor comes up in both, but is seen in different spheres. Like, yes, there have been improvements in pain management and safety during childbirth over the years. And yes, men aren't the only ones to ever work the ground. But 
Over the course of human history, haven't these curses been the general human experience for, for men and for women, for male and female? The Bible is unadulterated in how messed up human relationships are after this moment. That's what our world is like. We, we can just look at around ourselves and we can see that, I think. That is why we have the battle of the sexes, the blurring of the sexes. Inequality, injustice, confusion, abuse, unfaithfulness. All because we, not just Adam and Eve, but all of us have rejected God. And so his beautiful design for male and female has been fractured and leaves us under this curse of sin. What hope is there? The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, he's our hope. He's the only one to perfectly live according to God's beautiful design for relationships, male, female, with his heavenly Father. He's the one who redeems us from the curse of sin by his death and resurrection and makes something beautiful in us again out of ashes. And of course, the men in the Gospels have never met a man like Jesus. But can I just highlight for a moment the, the countercultural and absolutely beautiful way that Jesus treated women? Like, yes, he still had 12 male disciples because they had a particular uh, 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 role. But of Jesus' attitude to women, he values them with the greatest dignity. He never patronizes them, never dismisses them, he honors them. He calls them to serious discipleship as much as any man. That is the greatest honor to call to be called to serious discipleship. Uh, if you want to think about that a bit more or see how does Jesus relate with, with women, go and read Luke chapter 8 this afternoon. Great accounts there of a whole range of different women that Jesus comes across. Uh, for the rest of our time, though, now, I, I want to explore three implications of the gospel, uh, or in light of the gospel. Uh, and, and I'll say up front as well, each of these implications could easily be a sermon in its own right. It, they could easily be a whole sermon series in their own right. But we're going to have a go with it nonetheless, okay? So come with me in this. Number one, firstly, what does it look like being a Christian man or Christian woman? I mean, the world certainly has got all sorts of ideals and pictures for masculinity, for example. It might put forward the kind of the aggressive, ambitious, alpha male sort of thing, or the, the beefy man bursting with bravado. We often think that to be a man, you've got to have certain manly traits that women don't have, and vice versa. And this sort of thinking so easily creeps into the church. We think that the Christian guy has to have a Bible in one hand and a hunting rifle in the other. You know? We think that the Christian guy has to be strong and courageous, while the Christian woman has to be relational and gentle. And that women's church events have to be gingerbread houses and flower arrangements. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but we think that's what, has to, that's what it means to be a Christian woman. Now, what's the problem with these kind of assumptions? Well, we all know, I hope, women who are strong and courageous. Mary, Ruth, Deborah, and the list goes on in the Bible. And equally, we all know men who are relational and gentle. How about Jesus? <laughs> now, sure, there are some traits more common to men and others to women. Men have certain tendencies Women have others. But we've got to be careful that we don't define Christian manhood and Christian womanhood according to particular traits, as if strength is only a man thing, a male thing, and gentleness is only a female thing, because the Bible doesn't do that. So what does the Bible do? What does the Bible say about being a Christian man or woman? Firstly, the Bible doesn't call us to gender but to godliness. It doesn't call us to gender, but to godliness. God is not making us into an image of masculinity 
or of femininity. He's calling us into the image, into the likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what He's doing. God's calling us to respond to Christ, to live like Christ. And He does so not in spite of our gender. He doesn't throw it out the window and goes, that's completely irrelevant and unimportant. He does it through our gender. He has made us male and female. He does it through our gender. As one writer puts it, if it is more natural for a man to be aggressive and a woman to be passive then a genuine encounter with Christ should challenge a man to become gentle and a woman to become bold. And even if you were to think about the same kind of area of of showing compassion, right? How a man or a woman expresses genuine godly compassion might look different in different ways, subtly different or more. Different tone, different actions, different words, because God has made us male and female. And yet we are all called to be moving and being like Christ by the work of his spirit. But still, man and woman. The Bible, though, does give some gender-specific commands to men and women, But these are always grounded in the complementary roles and relationships that God has beautifully designed. So let's have a look then at in marriage, kind of in the home, and in the church. So firstly, marriage. As we heard from our second Bible reading there, Ephesians chapter 5, we see again this picture of complementary relationship between a husband and and wife, equal and distinct. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, on my wedding day, Rachel and I, uh, our wedding dress, uh, wedding dress, our wedding, our wedding, that, this is getting awkward, uh, our wedding dance, our wedding dance, equal but distinct, okay? Uh, our wedding dance was getting clunky. I mean, it was just clunky from the beginning, and I'm, I'm not doing a good job of it. I'm, you know, it's kind of almost robotic. You know, it's kind of focus on the triangle, Cameron. Focus on the triangle. Uh, look, that's not... That might have been my wedding day dance, but for God's design for marriage relationship, it's not clunky at all. It's a dance, so to speak, where the man leads and the woman follows, and yet they move together as one in perfect harmony. But we see the beauty of marriage in even higher definition when we know that the husband-wife relationship is actually a wonderful picture of how Christ and his church relate. God has designed marriage so beautifully in in, in this complementary way that it would point to the ultimate marriage in heaven. And so because of this, the husband and the wife have different roles. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. The wife has a role to submit to her husband, his headship, his leadership. And as with that word helper, Submission does not mean the wife is lesser. If you want to think about that more, go listen to Mike's sermon from Colossians 3 from uh, last year, and he unpacks it there in that particular passage. But, but what's the husband's role? Is it to make his wife submit? No way. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, it couldn't be further from the truth. What's the husband's role? Verse 25, look at this, husband's. Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. How did Christ love the church? He gave up his life for her. And so too, every day, your role, husbands, is to give up your life or to lay down your life for your wife. That's what it is. Your role, husbands, is to lead through sacrificial love. Your job, husbands, is to be the biggest champion of your wife's godliness. Your calling, husbands, is to spare no effort in seeing the work of Christ advance in your wife's life. In fact, the way you might lead 
will certainly be, in, in, in a, whole, a number of times, will be and involve serving your wife. It will be looking after kids. It will be doing housework. It will be doing other and having other responsibilities. Perhaps why? So she can get to Hope Group. So that you and your whole family can come along to church. You will lead that way by serving to enable that all to happen. And to that, God says to wives, submit and respect your husbands as they seek to live out this high calling. Wives, encourage your husbands in this task. Be his number one fan as he seeks to lead and stumbles along the way. And you, wife, you might know much more of the Bible. You might be more familiar and comfortable with praying and so forth. But use that humbly to encourage him to lead and the family, you, you, to lead you and the family. And yet we know that despite the beautiful design, it's not always beautifully lived out, is it? Sin taints even the best of marriages and is the cause of far more destructive things too. And can I say, if you're in a marriage which is dangerous and abusive or unhealthy, being submissive does not mean shut up and stay. The way you may be a true helper as a wife or a true leader as a husband is to reach out and get help. Please do that. Speak to someone. Church, we've got to be careful not to judge this picture of a, a complementary marriage based on other things apart from the Bible. We've got to be careful not to judge it on what we've seen in tradition, some stereotypical 1950s kind of ideal perhaps, or some other cultural, ethnic cultural background that you've come from or been exposed to. We must remember that any distortion or abuse uh, uh, of these complementary roles in marriage does not mean that there's something wrong with God's good design. It just shows how far that we've strayed from it and how much we need His grace and mercy. Because marriage, as we see it in the Bible, is beautiful by design. Why is that? Because the relationship between Christ and His church is beautiful. That's why. Well, finally, let me speak about the church. Uh, with my limited time left, of course, I humbly hope to show you at least the consistency and beauty of complementary male-female relationships in church. And, and just as these relationships play out in the home, so too is the church God's household. Now, this is what Paul says to Timothy in his first letter. I have written so that you will know how people ought to act in God's household, which is the church of the living God. You know what? And in God's household, we are a family. Not like a family. We are a family, as we keep banging on about, and rightly so. And then Paul says this to Timothy, I think, to illustrate this idea. He says in chapter 5, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and with all propriety, the younger women as sisters. We are equal. We are united. We are co-heirs of grace, right? So God's design for his church has no room whatsoever for superiority. But it certainly does for authority. Good Christ-shaped authority that is given to appropriate men. Uh, in chapter 2 of this very same letter to Timothy, Paul says this about when the church family formally gathers together. Chapter 2, a woman should learn in silence with full submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She, uh, instead, she is to be silent. For Adam was created first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and transgressed. Now, the call here to be silent or, or quiet does not mean a woman never speaks in church. Okay? Please hear that. 
across the, old, uh, the New Testament, really, uh, we see the precious roles of women, in, including in teaching. Women are to have in the life of the church. Teaching other women, teaching children, uh, and in prophecy, in, in corporate prayer. In fact, all believers, male and female, are to encourage and teach one another through fellowship and in song. And I hope you see this played out and celebrated here in your church too. Everyone is to do this role of teaching with a, a, a lowercase t, a little t, if I can put it that way. But it is only men and only certain men, as 1 Timothy chapter 3 goes on to say, who have the authoritative role, are given this authoritative role of Capital T teaching and and preaching as the church family gathers. Now, Paul is not saying that all women are to submit themselves to all men all the time. Rather, as Claire Smith writes in her book, and as as the men, just really, I think, as the men in the congregation (laughs) submit to the teacher, well, so too women are to be submissive in church when. The teaching is happening to what is taught and those men who are men uh, who are teaching it. Why? Because it's grounded in creation. Paul doesn't just sort of say this because you know there's a couple of rowdy women there, and so it only applies to them and has no ongoing sort of relevance to us today. No, it's grounded in the equal and distinct roles that God has given according to his beautiful design, and also which we saw flipped in Genesis chapter 3. And can I say it's utterly tragic when people, pastors, churches have distorted this, have abused this teaching. It's tragic for many reasons, certainly because it blinds people from seeing the beautiful goodness of God's design. Let's finish up. Can I just go back to that one another ministry that we all, male and female, are to have together. Because I am so encouraged to see this in our church family, this one another ministry. I've been encouraged of late seeing a group of people care for one of our single sisters at the moment who has a major injury, helping with groceries and trips to hospital and lifts to church, men and women together caring for one another as family. I love my hope group on Friday night, where even though I was leading, there was this, this period, a wonderful, beautiful period where I just sat back and it just kept on rolling. People were just contributing and chatting and, and directing one another to the passage and the verses in the Bible and, and showing and explaining things and, and how it applies to life. And this is what we do together, this vital one another ministry. I see older men teaching younger men, older women teaching younger women. And that too is a beautiful thing because you know what? Women, you, you possess a way of being human that men don't. And men, you possess a way of being human that women don't. And that means women, you possess ways of disciple making that men don't and vice versa. And this too is a precious thing in God's design. I mean, if ministry by women in our church is minimised, marginalised or absent, it would be to a great detriment of the church. In fact, it would be an incredibly unhealthy, unbiblical, we would be an ugly church because we would be missing out on how God has made his church to be beautiful by design. So how about we pray to our Father in heaven and ask for his help as we live this out. Join with me. Father, thank you for how you have so beautifully designed our male and female relationships to be a blessing to one another and also certainly to point to the beauty of the gospel of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, help us to humbly sit under your word in which you reveal your ways of wisdom and grace and to humbly love one another as we continue to navigate pulling all these things and putting them into practice. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.